Hello and welcome to today's discussion on antitrust law and how it can be a tool for helping workers. My name is Mary Alice McCarthy and I direct the Center on Education and Labor at New America. Over the last decade, there has been a resurgence of interest in antitrust law and in the role that market concentration, that is the domination of a particular product or service market by just a few firms, the role that, that market concentration is playing in the growth of economic inequality over the last several decades. This phenomenon of growing market concentration and declining competitiveness is occurring across many different industries and markets, most notably in technology, but also in industries like healthcare, retail and hospitality, transportation and warehousing, and more. Most of the scholarship and writing on antitrust has focused on the negative impacts of these oligopolistic markets on consumers, particularly on prices and on the quality of specific products and services. Not as much has been written about the impact of market concentration on workers and labor markets. That is until recently. And today I have the tremendous privilege to welcome two of the foremost thinkers and writers on antitrust policy, broadly speaking, and on its potential for helping workers specifically. So please welcome Eric A. Posner, Kirkland and Ellis Distinguished Service Professor of Law from the University of Chicago, and Tim Wu, Special Assistant to the President for Technology and Competition Policy at the White House National Economic Council, and formerly a professor at Columbia University and a former New America Fellow. So, Welcome to you both and thank you very much for joining us today. My pleasure to be here. Likewise, thanks for having us. Great, so Eric, let's go ahead and get started with you. You've done a lot of writing on antitrust and workers specifically, probably more than anyone. And, and just last year, you published a book titled How Antitrust Failed Workers. So I think a, an obvious place to start would be with just that. Um, how has antitrust policy failed workers? And, and can you please give us some concrete examples uh, of, of that failure? Sure, um, and as you mentioned, uh, uh, Mary Alice, uh, most of the focus of antitrust law has been on product markets. And so when people think of antitrust law, they think of the law that's used to counter um, technology companies uh, hospitals, uh, pharmaceutical companies, and other companies from raising prices through uh, concentration and various types of collusive behavior. Now, antitrust law, though, applies to all markets, not just to product markets. It applies to labor markets as well. And yet, uh, there's been relatively little discussion about the application of antitrust law to labor markets. And until recently, there was hardly any at all. And uh, this is quite surprising when you think about it, because just as firms can um, engage in, for example, price fixing agreements in order to raise prices in product markets, they can also engage in wage fixing agreements in order to reduce wages in labor markets. And that has exactly the same type of, of harm. People as consumers have to pay higher prices. People as workers have to pay, uh, uh, receive lower wages. So examples, uh, there have been a, a number of examples of well-documented docu well collusive behavior in labor markets over the last few years. Now, most of these examples do involve legal uh, action of some sort uh, because they were so uh, blatant and outrageous. But uh, the, the problem is, is that there's so little of it. And there's a lot of this behavior going on, which has been um, uh, you know, su suggested very strongly by academic literature. But, but let me just give some examples to, to get uh, people's intuitions going. So a few years ago, a pair of economists at Princeton published a paper which looked at franchise agreements. So the big franchise companies like McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger Kings, they enter into what are called franchise agreements with uh, their franchisees. These are the restaurants that people actually enter. And um, these restaurants are not owned by um, these companies, they actually have a franchise contract with them. And these economists discovered that in most of these franchise agreements, uh, and these are agreements among, involving among the most famous uh, com uh, companies in the country like McDonald's, there were what was called a no poach agreement. And the no poach agreement says that um, a particular franchise restaurant, for example, is not allowed to hire away a worker from another franchise restaurant. So for example, and there's a case involving a woman who worked for a McDonald's restaurant in Chicago. She was uh, solicited by an, another restaurant. She was being paid a, you know, 10 or 11 or $12 an hour by the first restaurant. And the owner of the other restaurant said, why don't you come and work for me? I'll pay you more. 
I value your skills more. But then uh, they learned that uh, the, the, uh, the owner of the second franchise uh, learned that the no poaching agreement prohibited that type of behavior. So he said, never mind. And she was unable to obtain this job. So that's a collusive agreement between competitors. These restaurants compete for, uh, for workers. These franchise agreements uh, cover millions of people. And so these uh, no poach agreements that these economists discovered uh, apply to millions of people. Uh, there has been litigation against them. And most of the, I understand that most of these uh, franchises have dropped the no poach clauses from these franchise agreements. But the follow on litigation on behalf of uh, the workers, like the woman I was referring to at the McDonald's, that has uh, uh, encountered headwinds in the courts because courts uh, are unfamiliar with this type of antitrust violation and uh, seem to be a little bit confused about how best to address them. A related example, um, this is also a kind of a famous scandal from a few years back. Uh, Jimmy John's, the sandwich chain, had inserted non-compete clauses into the employment agreements with uh, its workers. These were the people who uh, made sandwiches at Jimmy John's. And a non-compete agreement is a, is a bit like a no poach agreement. It's a bit different. The employee uh, who's bound by a non-compete agreement is not allowed to work for any company that competes with Jimmy John's within a few miles of a Jimmy John's. And because there are thousands of Jimmy John's around the country, the, these non-compete uh, clauses effectively prevented a worker who was fired from a Jimmy John's from you know, working uh, for a competitor like Subway. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and apparently when some workers did try, their bosses would tell them you can't do that because of this non-compete. Non-compete, as the name suggests, is an anti-competitive agreement. They're uh, traditionally regulated under the common law, which puts some restrictions on them. But the type of uh, non-compete that Jimmy John's used, which just applied to all employees, regardless of how skillful they are, were clearly anti-competitive, not only hurting their workers directly, but hurting their competitors. Other employers wouldn't be able to hire workers that they needed. And that could result not only in lower wages for the workers, but higher prices for the people who uh, go to these uh, restaurants. And I'll give you one more example, uh, irrelevant to the pandemic. Um, so markets, uh, labor markets involving registered nurses have been studied quite a bit. And uh, recently two hospitals in Texas merged and uh, they, they had to obtain the approval of the Texas agency, which ultimately gave approval. But the Federal Trade Commission submitted a comment uh, uh, in which they opposed this merger. And they pointed out that the two hospital systems that planned to merge uh, uh, employed 50% and 45% respectively of, the, of all of the registered nurses in the area. So when they joined together, they would, uh, as a merged entity, they would employ 95% of, of the registered nurses in, in the area. Now, if they employ 95% you know, of the registered nurses, these nurses really have no other options. They work for this company, no matter how little it pays them and how bad the conditions are, or they quit. You know, some people can move away to another market, but most people, uh, because of family commitments and other uh, connections, you know, can't, don't have that option. This uh, merger I found particularly striking in light of some academic research uh, that was published recently, which looked at mergers of hospitals around the country so a large number of hospitals, and found that when hospitals and concentrated labor markets merged, uh, the wage growth for medical professionals declined compared to hospitals that did not merge or hospitals that merged in more competitive markets. So at least for this Texas uh, merger, you know, it only happened recently, but one would expect that the uh, registered nurses are going to be harmed uh, over time. So these are all cases that you know, should at least be subject to antitrust litigation. Um, there have been attempts by some private uh, lawyers to bring cases, but they're very difficult. And, uh, and I think it's very likely that there are you know, many more examples of this type of collusive behavior around the country. And, and the reason for thinking that is that um, yet another set of, of papers, of academic papers, have shown that there's an extremely high level of labor market concentration around the country, meaning that uh, you know, various areas in the country for particular types of jobs, there are only a handful of employers, one or two, or three maybe. And when one or two or three uh, employers 
exist in a market, it's very easy for them to collude to hold down wages. And even if they don't explicitly collude, they can um, you know, basically ensure that wages are not as high as they should be. So this is probably a, a very big problem. And, uh, and, uh, and I think that you know, there should be more um, you know, antitrust law. It's the type of problem that anti antitrust law is appropriate for. So thank you for that. Those were those were such interesting examples. And I just want to note that two out of three of your examples, two were of relatively low wage workers, right? Workers in fast food restaurants, you know, the, the hospital workers, the registered nurses, not so much. But but I think too, when people think of things like anti-poaching and non-competes, they're they're probably thinking of very highly skilled workers with, you know, uh, you know, in, in, in super competitive markets. Um, and this is a very low wage workers who have very who are who are very vulnerable already and quite precarious. So that's that's very striking. Um, and that brings me to to the next question, which is, you know, in in your writing, you do explain how this market concentration distorts labor markets and makes them less competitive. But you also write about why those impacts on those, particularly those vulnerable workers, have not gotten as much attention from lawyers, from unions, and from policymakers. And can you share with us a little bit about why this is a a problem that has been sort of not not taken up by lawyers, policymakers, and unions. Sure, I, I think there are two basic reasons. Can I interrupt that and say uh, has historically not been taken up? Thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, times are Thank changing, um, but there are two basic reasons. Uh, the first is political, and the second is intellectual. So, back when antitrust law was first created in the late nineteenth, early twentieth century. It was initially used against unions um, rather than against uh, sellers. This is kind of well known. And there's this long history of union suspicion toward antitrust law because, um, because of that. But um, probably what's more important is that when workers were trying to um, you know, aggregate their bargaining power to oppose uh, employers that underpaid them, union organization was the natural way to do that. And so not only did uh, uh, workers organize unions, but they also tried to persuade Congress and, and state legislatures to support unions in, in various ways. And that's where all the energy was. Um, union uh, density in this country increased fairly steadily until the 1950s. And I think until that time, it probably never occurred to people that they needed antitrust law, the workers that they needed antitrust law, it was the union that would uh, negotiate with the employer in order to sure, ensure that wages were not suppressed below the competitive level. But union uh, density, as, as everyone knows, has declined uh, quite rapidly, especially in the private sector since the 1950s. And union, most people, you know, very few people compared to the entire working population are unionized. And so there's this gap, I think, left over by the decline of, of unions. And, uh, and I think that uh, 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 this is a gap that antitrust law could at least partly fill. The second is, is intellectual, and it's related to this point. But um, strikingly, you, you know, I think there's a story here where uh, economists were drawn to antitrust law because there was a lot of antitrust litigation, but it was all in the product markets. And so there's a field in economics called industrial organization, or IO, which studies uh, product markets. And so the economists in that field were hired and paid to serve as expert witnesses. And this uh, stimulated more work in the field with the result that the field advanced you know, very far, antitrust litigation became increasingly complex. Now the IO people were not focused on labor because they don't do labor. There's another field of econ economics called labor econ economics and the labor economists were focused on unions because of their historical importance and other elements of the employment relationship. And they weren't so concerned about market structure. And so the, uh, the, you know, over time, the government hired these IO economists to help uh, bring cases. They didn't hire the labor economists. The labor economists weren't really focused on antitrust issues because they weren't being hired and there wasn't that litigation. Um, and so uh, this kind of bifurcation uh, has acted as a real drag on antitrust litigation and labor markets. Now, this is all changing just over the last few years. Uh, labor, labor economists have discovered antitrust. They've discovered this problem of labor market concentration. So I think this too will change in the near future. Great, thank you for that. And, and let's use that as our, our segue to you, Tim. Um, and uh, 
Thank you so much for joining us. And, and to your point, yes, this is a, a we're in a very different place in the policy conversation today. You've been writing about antitrust for a long time. Um, so can you share with us a, a, a little bit, first of all, of what you think about this trend, you know, this move towards more focus on labor markets? Um, um, give us a little bit of perspective of what of how that field is um, thinking has developed as one of the first sort of people thinking about antitrust and anything about um, Eric's work or writing that has surprised you or that you want to react to? Yeah, sure. Thanks. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as, as I mentioned, I was uh, uh, a um, New America fellow and I really uh, appreciated those, those years and they uh, helped me write my own uh, first book, which is always a challenge for, for, all, for anyone. Um, I wanted to say uh, a, a few things. So uh, yeah, there, there has been, I think, an intellectual and a, a somewhat political and policy movement uh, surrounding antitrust revitalization. Uh, someone said the antitrust winter is over a, a few years ago, and I think that's true. Um, but I, like any uh, kind of uh, movement or thing, there are different segments uh, to it. And I, I uh, um, think that... Uh, that uh, in some ways, we look back at this uh, five years later from now that that labor antitrust um, may really uh, turn out to be one of the areas with with some of the most legs and uh, depths and, and potential. Uh, I think that uh, once you um, start to, uh, in some ways, look at the other side of the market or look at labor markets, you, you can't undo it. And it makes your uh, it's like putting on a different pair of glasses or maybe the scales fall from your eyes or something. And it really changes the way you think about um, a lot of problems. Um, uh, I uh, am a uh, reader of uh, most things that, that Eric uh, has writes or has written over the years. This one, I really think he's hit the jackpot. Uh, I think he's come out with um, the right book at the right time. Uh, I think it's having enormous influence um, in the administration and uh, uh, and, and how people are thinking about all these problems. Um, you know, and uh, Eric and I uh, have been around long enough to know that doesn't happen with every single thing you write. <laughs> and uh, that I think in this case, it, it sort of... Uh, but in my mind, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I think that's, and uh, I think that this, uh, this work that Eric is doing, obviously it's other people as well, but the work he's doing is, um, just puts it so uh, clearly and, and uh, uh, really lays a roadmap for, um, I think, what will be some significant changes in this area. In fact, we've already started, I probably shouldn't comment on individual matters, but I, I think if you analyze um, some of the, the work that uh, Justice and FTC is doing, you can already start to see the influence of, of this kind of thinking on their work. Um, so in terms of what's surprising, uh, you know, when I read the book, and I think Eric always, uh, I can't remember what page it on, but he, he talks about how as, as recently as the early thousands, uh, that industrial economists were happy to just assume perfect competition in labor markets as an input. And um, I think it's worth uh, dwelling on that for a second. Um, you know, economics uh, is somewhat famous for its unrealistic assumptions. Um, that's uh, part of what uh, also it makes it useful. But um, uh, when you think about it, that, that this one is, uh, and this is kind of the power, is just uh, discovering just how unrealistic that, that assumption is. Um, you know, it, it, the assumption is that if a job with higher wages sort of emerged uh, anywhere, nothing stops the worker from taking it. And so the employer is compelled um, by the market to, to pay a competitive wage. That's kind of where it leads. Um, but, you know, if you think about it, um, you know, for most of us, uh, Moving cities or towns is not exactly costless or leaving behind a nice uh, job you've had for some period. Um, in fact, uh, for most things, it seems exactly backwards. Um, you know, uh, I think most of us probably find it easier to frequent a different restaurant or maybe even change the brand of cola you drink or, or um, whatever the, the case may be. In other words, change products, substitute a product, maybe eat... Um, uh, popcorn instead of uh, chips if the prices of chips go too high. Uh, we find probably find that easier than, uh, than, than changing jobs. So in some ways, it's almost exactly backwards. Um, and in fact, that was, you know, 
Eric referred to the uh, to labor law, and, uh, or at least to the labor movement. And, you know, that was sort of the, the assumption, I think, of the labor movement that, um, at least originally, the workers were, were too powerless, um, you know, to change jobs easily. And that's why they had to unite and bargain collectively. So anyway, I just want to say that that uh, really, really sort of it surprised me that I, well, all of us, um, you know, have blind spots and um, uh, can go years without really thinking about something. But it's amazing to me as an entire endeavor that everyone was like, yeah, that's fine. You know, and didn't really think about looking very often at the labor side of these markets. I appreciate that that very much, and I will say, you know, similarly, the thing that I think was most striking to me as I read uh, how antitrust failed workers was this sort of realization, the obvious realization that everything that we, so much of what we do in the workforce development and education space, is based on the premise that labor markets are competitive. Yeah. Uh, and that it's taken as a given. And many of the strategies, particularly in workforce development, make that assumption and, and, uh, and what it means to, to not do that. So I'd like to come back to that, but I wanna come back, um, Tim, to, you know, you're, you're at the White House, um, um, figured, you know, like all of us virtually these days, but um, for, or right now, um, but uh, can you share with us a little bit more about how the Biden administration is thinking about antitrust policy in, in relation to workers? I, I realize, you know, within the limits of what you can share. <laughs> All right. um, and, uh, uh, and, and in particular, I guess, it's how do you think about a pol uh, this policy area? What does it mean for the Department of Labor? What does it, you know, wh where do these things sit? We're used to having um, uh, policies and, and regulations and practices that affect workers come through the Department of Labor. Just wondering if you have anything you can share about the administration's thinking in this space and, and how it's evolving. Yeah, I think that's uh, a question we're, we're very happy to talk about. Um, uh, I'll, I'll start by saying, you know, I think there's a, a, a democratic imperative in this area. You know, antitrust is often or has been thought of as being something of a, of a uh, technocratic. It is sort of necessarily somewhat technical, but I, you know, there is a, there is a demand, I think, felt by this, uh, by this uh, administration um, that, uh, that something be done differently than has been done for the last, let's say, 20 or 30 years, 40 years, uh, with respect to who is who are the winners and losers in the economy. Um, you know, there is there's an acute popular demand, um, not really uh, left wing or right wing, that um, that uh, people get a better sort of better shake, and um, you know, and that's um, and I think that has a lot to do with the relative uh, power of employers and, and workers, and um, you know, some of the statistics on. Uh, that people have seen about uh, uh, this is starting to change, but you know, for a long time there was a, a real uh, lack of, of change in in real wages. Um, so I I, uh, I think I want to suggest that the these concerns aren't sort of in the air, but have been uh, uh, taken uh, seriously in visceral uh, ways by by this White House. Um, the if you look at the executive order on uh, competition, uh, which came out on July 9th. Uh, you know, I don't wanna read all of it, but um, it's, it said this, you know, could, could, could have been written by, uh, by Eric maybe. Um, here, I'll, I'll, I'll do a quote. The Ameri this is from the executive order signed by the president. The American, promise abroad of, the American promise of a broad and sustained prosperity depends on an open competitive economy. For workers, a competitive marketplace creates more high quality jobs and the economic freedom to switch jobs or negotiate a higher wage. So you know it's full of things like like that, and um, I think signals um, and you know executive orders um, and uh, and the the president uh, and the White House we don't obviously dictate individual cases but we do dictate enforcement policy and I think we've made it clear uh, to the uh, uh, enforcement agencies so the Justice Department and the Federal Trade Commission that we uh, you know want them to be thinking seriously about the, these these ideas. And I, you know, that comes all the way from the top. The president is um, uh, very uh, focused. I think he got sort of his entrance to, to becoming an antitrust uh, person, I think wasn't, uh, didn't come from price theory, but came from really uh, probably from non-competes and um, the sense that, uh, uh, you know, workers are kind of getting a raw deal, not being able to switch jobs, um, something he's uh, you know, signaled in the back when he was vice president but uh, has always had a very a great sensitivity to. Um, so, you know, he's, he's personally very invested in this stuff. And um, I, I will say, you know, you asked, so how does this manifest itself? Well, so partially it's through the setting of, of competition, 
policy by the White House. Partially it's through who has been appointed. And um, partially it's in a, in a call um, for, for whole government uh, cooperation and um, things like having the Justice Department and the, and the Labor Department uh, uh, work together among other agencies. So that, that's, I think, the shift. I think that um, you know, there, there, there are traditional labor agencies and then there are antitrust agencies. And I think um, one of the big shifts is we will think of more labor policy, frankly, coming from the antitrust sides. Thank you for that. I do have a couple more questions, but before I go on, I want to um, first just um, let our audience know we are taking questions. We will we will take questions, so I encourage you to put your questions in the Slido box uh, um, as we're going to continue to talk, and then we'll move to a Q and A period. Also, though, want to give you Eric a, a chance to respond to anything that that Tim said and or any thoughts that you wanted to share before we go on to another question. Well, I mean, I do think that that executive order from last July was an amazing document. Um, uh, the president is the first president who has um, made it a priority to address labor market problems from an antitrust or competition uh, perspective. Um, so th there's a lot more in that in that executive order, but I was very excited to, to see that. And I think it's, it's very important. Uh, and, and this... Um, this idea of getting other parts of the government involved is also an extremely important one. The, the tradition is that Justice Department and the Federal Trade, Trade Commission, they bring antitrust cases and um, you know, they do some administrative uh, uh, work as well to address problems of, anti, uh, of competition. But you know, lots of agencies uh, have authority in this area. They're, you know, their bank mergers are governed by banking agencies and you know there are you know air, airline mergers and uh, you know mergers of radio stations and so forth. There, there are often other agencies are involved, so it's it's very important that they coordinate, and particularly the Department of Labor. So the Department of Labor, um, there are various components of it which have a great deal of authority over uh, employers and how they treat workers. And uh, I'm not an expert on the Department of Labor, but I believe that in the past they have not been focused on. Uh, uh, problems of competition, like non-competes, for example, but they certainly have that power to get to gather information and to coordinate with other agencies to bring enforcement actions as necessary. So I think this could be very important. Great, thank you for that, and that's great. So, related to that, then a question for both of you um, is: you know, for worker advocates, or whether they're unions or just organizations dedicated to supporting workers. What can they do to leverage antitrust policy to help workers? Any advice or guidance you can offer to, to folks who are out there in the field advocating on behalf of workers? Uh, a quick thought, um, unions should bring antitrust cases. Uh, they have in the past. Um, the SEIU has brought, I, I believe, a, a few antitrust cases. Um, that was years ago. But I, uh, there's still a great deal of hesitation, but unions are in an excellent position to do this, to find out about anti-competitive behavior because they often have members who uh, in a particular industry who work in different companies. And so if certain types of parallel behavior occurs that may uh, uh, suggest illegal collusive behavior, non-competes, you know, there, there are ways that unions can gather information about uh, potentially anti-competitive behavior. Uh, and, and, and then actually bring the lawsuit on behalf of their of the, of union members. Um, so certainly they should you know, put some effort into thinking about this and investigating, and, uh, and it'll be interesting to see what they find. Yeah, I um, uh, you know, don't wanna comment on, on, on litigation or bring litigation, but I do think, uh, I, I will say the White House has met uh, with, with, with uh, a number of unions on on uh, on their interests, and I think they're showing a lot of uh, uh, interest and potential in, in these areas, and I, I think that's very promising. Um, I think that um, being involved in the policy debates is, is very important. I'll, I'll I'll highlight something that's going on right now. Uh, there is a um, an effort to uh, led by the Justice Department and the Federal Trade Commission to uh, redo the merger guidelines. And obviously, one of the key questions in merger guidelines is what uh, kind of market uh, markets do you uh, assess? And I think people who are interested in 
uh, labor and, and a worker ranch trust might want to be active in that, uh, in that, for example, obviously invite everybody, but that's an example where I think the, the, uh, the input of uh, people into policy uh, would be very, very valuable. Over. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. It's the, that, the, the famous mute button. Yes, and then suddenly not being able to find it. That's 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 very helpful. Um, uh, so just have one more question before we'll sort of then open things up to to some questions that are coming into the audience. I, I did mention too. Yes, I, I, I my background and, and and a lot of the work of the the center I run has been in the field of workforce development and uh, and also a lot on career and technical education and things like apprenticeships as well. But underlying, undergirding a lot of the, the sort of um, funding models and just theories of change around education and workforce development is this assumption of competitive markets and it's kind of human capital theory that, you know, making people, you know, building, uh, equipping people with skills and credentials to be more competitive in, in the marketplace. Um, so I'm trying to wrap my head around what, what does it mean to think about workforce development uh, in education um, for workers who may be going into very non-competitive labor markets? And I realize that's a, a you know, question that to me, that's sort of like, where do I, where do I take this in, into my work? And um, I realize that's not uh, your background, but would love any thoughts, uh, um, just you know, open-ended thoughts on just what, what strikes you is, is sort of what we should be thinking about, those of us working in this in this space. Well, Eric is an educator, so I guess I'll defer to him. I'm a former educator. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. for lawyers, I could talk about educating lawyers, but but I won't. Um, instead, let me let me give you this the, a few thoughts about this. So I, I do think there's a, a kind of a revolution taking place in uh, in labor economics, and and even among labor economists, there is this assumption of no more or less competitive markets, and that's changing. I, th I think increasingly labor economists are gonna talk about what they call monopsony, labor monopsony, meaning lack of competition in labor markets. And, and once you move from a competitive model to a monopsony model, a lot of things change in sometimes surprising ways. Um, you know, a famous example, before I get to your question, is the minimum wage. You know, in a competitive labor market, if you raise the minimum wage, that can lead to unemployment. Um, in a monopsonized labor market, if you raise the minimum wage, that just results in higher wages and actually more potentially more employment. And one of the reasons why people's views have shifted about markets is that the empirical research <coughs> is complicated, but it, it tends to suggest that minimum raising the minimum wage does not reduce employment, which supports this view of labor monopsony. So, you know, a kind of a popular uh, tool among, uh, uh, you know, people, Democrats, generally people, um, on the, the left or the center left actually becomes more powerful under the late labor monopsony uh, model. But there are other tools that become more complicated. And this brings me to your question about workforce development. So, you know, in a competitive market, you know, imagine, you know, there are people working uh, in a competitive market. And so uh, economists say they should receive a wage that basically matches their productivity. So if the government steps in and offers them uh, training and they get trained, let's just say hypothetically on the weekends or in the evening, they become more productive and that means their wage should go up because as they become more productive, more revenues come in and the employer becomes afraid of losing that worker to a competitor. So if the worker says, well, I'm gonna leave unless you raise my wage, the employer says, fine. And so a lot of the gains from the, the training, most of it will actually accrue to the worker. But now let's uh, move to a monopsonized labor market. And to take an extreme case, imagine there's just a single employer. Imagine like a small town somewhere and there's you know, one accounting firm or one uh, chicken processing plant and that's basically your only choice for a certain set of skills. Well, if the government gives this person training, the person will become more productive and revenues will go up. But now um, when the worker says, look, I'm more productive, you should pay me more, the employer is going to think, well, you know, what are you going to do if I don't pay you more, right? There's no com com competitor to go to. So the employer will be less inclined to raise uh, the workers' wages. Now, the employer will probably raise them a bit, but not as much as in a competitive market. So ironically, one effect of um, training, government-sponsored training in a monopsonized market is that you're actually increasing the profits of the employers uh, depending on how the market is structured, possibly a lot more than you're benefiting the worker. Now, I do want to jump in and say, I, I do want to interrupt myself to say, you know, 
that's the worst case. All these markets are different. Some markets are reasonably competitive, others are not. And so the value of um, workplace training and so forth will depend a lot on market structure and, and it could continue to be valuable in some places and less valuable in another in others. But that's something now that, that you have to think about um, as you, you know, design and, and, uh, and propose uh, workplace uh, workforce development programs. Helpful. If I can say a word, I, I don't have anything uh, particular to, to say about training, but I do feel that um, uh, one reason I'm so excited about the, the work in this area and so it's also the policy development is, you know, it helps us get at this uh, uh, nut which this administration really wants to crack, which is how do you create a sustained sort of widespread prosperity, you know, which sounds like the kind of thing politician uh, might say, but also is really a challenging question. I, I think we've learned, you know, through through 40 years of microeconomics, how to generate wealth, but I'm not sure we've learned how you create a sort of broadly prosperous society. And, um, you know, there's, uh, I think the research being done, and I mean broadly prosperous, both among, among classes, the races, you know, regions of the country. So the whole whole country um, is, uh, feels, feels that kind of wealth. Um, uh, without killing the golden goose. And I think that that, um, you know, that is sort of one of the, uh, if, you, if you can get that right, um, in some ways you've really gotten to what, uh, a big thing for what we can do for people in this in this country, which is try to sort of, uh, you know, have a place where, or have a country, which has been the, the, the story of this country for a time where people can reliably expect to do better uh, than the generation before them. And, uh, feel that this is uh, the fabled land of opportunity. So um, maybe I'll just uh, leave it there and um, uh, turn to our next question or as you like. Wonderful. I'm gonna ask one very quick uh, follow-up question, um, which is again, a lot of um, to what we do in the workforce development field is labor market uh, gathering labor market information and doing and analyzing local labor markets. How hard is it to determine levels of monopsony or the, or the presence or, or intensity of monopsonistic labor markets? Is, are there tools available for that sort of thing? Is this like a common labor market analytic thing? I'm not familiar with it. Yes, yes. Well, they, these tools have been, you know, developed recently, and, and they really, really, what was needed was access to data, which is now available. They're enormous uh, resources. There, there are different kinds of labor monopsony. So, the, the what I'm focused on is concentration, the number of employers that uh, in a certain area that a given type of worker can realistically get a job from. And so um, there are a number of papers that just count them up. And you know, there, there are these, um, there's both government data, which will tell you how many employers are in a particular area. And you know, they usually use commuting zone, which is a kind of a big, it's like a city. Um, and, and you just count up the number of, let's say accounting firms, five, and the number of accountants, you know, and, and, and you have a sense of how much concentration there is. And, um, and so there's both the government data, as I mentioned, and there's also data from uh, private companies like Glassdoor. Glassdoor operates a platform that people can use to find jobs. There are you know, tens of millions of listings. And some of this uh, research has used data from Glassdoor and, and other uh, kind of platforms, intermediaries. There's another type of labor monopsony, which is a, which is a real problem, which is, um, which is the result of certain workplace frictions that are independent of concentration. So for example, if you're working at a job and you don't like it and you feel like you're not getting paid enough, it's not like just you know switching from Pepsi to Coke, as Tim was mentioning before. You have to do a search. You have to do interviews. That's all very costly. So that's another source of friction that gives the employer the ability to suppress wages. That too can be measured and has been measured. Um, uh, basically, you can kind of look at how frequently people change jobs. I mean, it's it's complicated, but that's basically what you can look at. And um, and and you know if wages change whether people, let, let's suppose wages you know, go down for some reason because of some kind of shock, like a recession. Do people leave or do they stay where they are? That's another way that you can measure uh, the, the degree of labor monopsony. And now there are you know, dozens and dozens of studies that look at this and, and they find actually people don't change their jobs you know, very much when, when their wages change. And everybody who's listening, you know, and, and, uh, and you, Mary Alice, and you, Tim, as well, I mean, you can just ask yourself if my if my employer just said, I'm gonna cut your wage by 10%, you know, 
would you quit? I, some people would, but most people, you know, for me, for example, what would I, well, I shouldn't say this in case my, my dean hears, but if they, if he cut my, you know, my wage, uh, I've got family here, you know, my wife is here, you know, I can't really just up and leave and find a, another employer. So this, uh, these types of uh, frictions are very important, but they are well documented and, uh, and, and available uh, to the public if, if you're interested. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. I'm the rare example of a person who took a job to, uh, to, for a pay cut. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you measure that, but anyway. Uh, so don't, don't tell your employer, just don't tell your employer. Yeah, that, that's been recorded too, but that's okay. <laughs> we'll edit that out. Um, okay, we do have some questions from the audience. So I'm gonna start with the first one here, which is what can be done to hold companies accountable when they pursue a promise a merger will create jobs, but then lay off workers once the transaction is approved? Um, that, that is a very good question, and I think a real challenge for, for um, antitrust law, which is, you know, the typical um, merger review process and is a projection and involves a, a enormous uh, number of promises, often of efficiencies or, or jobs or, um, you know, likewise. And, um, you know, and if they convince uh, court or agency that that's true, then, then uh, the, the Merger, I, I wouldn't say technically is approved, but is um, not acted on. Um, I will say that in the executive order on competition, we mentioned uh, that we said the exec that the um, that the agencies should um, be aware that they can challenge mergers retroactively and not forget that. I think they know that, um, and uh, it is clear under the law that you can challenge a merger retroactively, but somehow there's been a, sort of a campaign to pretend that's not true. Um, uh, but uh, it is true. And um, without mentioning specific cases, there's a major uh, litigation going on right now, which is in fact a retroactive challenge to a merger um, under section two of the, uh, of the Sherman Act. So um, the, the legal authority is there to act and in fact, I can mention a case that was completed uh, within the last couple of years. There was an example. It was a case around doors or something like that. Um, yeah, Carl Shapiro was the, was the expert economist. And uh, it was a, a retroactive challenge to a, a merger of door manufacturers when they had just lied to the agencies about what was going to happen. It was a private challenge, actually. And um, so that, that, that is um, uh, one avenue I would suggest that's a possibility. Yeah, I mean, and private litigation also. In principle, uh, the workers, if, if they're fired or their wages go down um, and other conditions are met, they should be able to bring an antitrust class action against the merged entity. And, you know, they should at least be able to obtain damages for lost wages. They may or may not be able to get the merger unwound. But, uh, you know, this, this has never happened. So, I mean, in, in law often, the law, you know, kind of supports you, but the practicalities, the logistics, the complexities may defeat any such uh, may defeat any such effort. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say it's never happened. Uh, where, where workers, where workers have gone. Oh, where workers, sorry. Yeah, there, yeah. there's the retroactive merger challenges. Standard Oil, for example. Sorry. Right. Right. For example, Standard Oil, famous antitrust case. In fact, was a retroactive challenge to yeah. series of mergers. Yeah, I, I was just talking about workers. Right. Okay. Our next question is, is again about uh, about litigation. Uh, the, and the Sherman Act, the Sherman Act, and antitrust laws are notoriously broad. Uh, given the Lochnerian bent of the Supreme Court, um, how will this worker-centered view of antitrust survive the courts? Well, it's hard to say, you know. Uh, and the question is a good one. I mean, what I've been trying to argue in in my work is that. You know, there's nothing radical about thinking that antitrust law uh, should apply to labor markets. In fact, the real Lochnerian court in the 1920s recognized uh, a, a case by seamen against their employers in California. So, you know, the idea that the antitrust apply antitrust law applies to labor markets it shouldn't be controversial. Um, and so there are probably a lot of low-hanging fruit that even, you know, a court that 
tends to be skeptical of challenges to businesses should be willing uh, to recognize. And the court did, you know, just in the recent Alston case, which involved, um, you know, the, uh, N uh, the NCAA, uh, the sports leagues, you know, it said, yeah, sure, antitrust law applies to, um, to workers. In this case, the workers were uh, student athletes. Um, so, uh, you know, the court should be open to this. I think the, the real problem is more practical. They're not used to these cases. You know, uh, lawyers aren't used to these cases. They're very complicated. So if they're brought in the right way by the right people with good facts, um, I, I'm optimistic that, uh, that at least some progress will be made. I think the real problem with, with the, the current Supreme Court and judges is they're just kind of hostile to antitrust law of all types, not, not just you know, worker-related antitrust law. And that, that's going to require probably legislation uh, to overcome. Tim, any thoughts or should yes, I go into the next question? Let me not comment on that. Yeah. Okay. Um, here's another question. With large companies able to depress wages in monopsonistic markets, presumably, how does that fit in with the popular story of wages as the primary driver of inflation, which is certainly something we're hearing a lot about right now? Any thoughts on that? Well, uh, wages is the primary driver of inf inflation. I mean, there's there, there are some... Let's see, there's some complicated points going around. I think, you know, there's inflation right now, which is uh, driven by all kinds of factors, supply chain disruption, maybe government debt. You know, there's a lot of debate going on. I don't think people think that inflation is being driven by, um, uh, it, well, it, can, it couldn't be driven by wage suppression, <laughs> right? So, so if wage suppression is occurring, you wouldn't, you wouldn't see a lot of inflation. You know, I wouldn't say as a general matter that uh, the concentration of labor markets is related to any kind of trend like rising inflation today or even the declining uh, share of uh, labor's, um, the, the decline in the labor share of output because the evidence such as it is suggests that this problem has been around for a long time, just that people haven't recognized it. So um, I don't, you know, I'm not sure what, I'm not a macroeconomist. I'm not sure what the relationship might be at the moment between uh, labor markets and inflation, but, you know, I don't think it's really an antitrust issue. Okay. I'll go on to the next question, unless you had something on that. So here's a question that says, you know, oligopoly enabled the big three automakers in the 1950s to pay high wages and to pass on the costs. Is the difference with the hospitals that Eric Posner cited that those nurses in those hospitals in Texas that you're talking about were not unionized. Is that the big difference between, so if you're operating in an oligopolistic uh, labor market, is unionization the thing that will make the difference in terms of who pays the, the, the costs? Uh, yeah, so, so if, uh, so if uh, you have, let's say uh, auto manufacturers uh, well, it, it's, it's complicated. So if they're an oligopoly, they, they can charge prices above the competitive price. So cars in the old days were expensive because there wasn't much competition between, uh, between the car manufacturers. There are only three of them. Now, meanwhile, in, in the labor markets, you know, there are only, there are only three employers who um, hire people to construct cars, right? So there's also oligopsony is the technical term in the labor market. Um, and so given all that market power, we would expect uh, the car companies to suppress wages in the labor market. But, but the labor market is unionized, as you mentioned. And so the unions are able to aggregate the power of workers and negotiate a wage which is higher than you know, the monopsony or the oligopsony uh, wage. Um, so, uh, so uh, unions are, are probably a very important factor, now a missing factor. And in, ma in many of these um, papers, uh, the economists do look at unions, like the, the hospital merger paper I told you about. Um, it compared mergers where the workers were unionized and mergers where they're not unionized. And where the workers were unionized, there wasn't um, the, 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 the decline in wage growth. That there was where the workers were were, were uh, not unionized. So you know, I think unions are a, a big part of this uh, 
I think people don't understand, you know, economists don't understand unions as well as they understand ununionized markets, because it's kind of hard to compare uh, a market that's unionized and a market that's not unionized because they're, they're different in, in lots of different ways. There is a, a lot of evidence that there's a wage premium when for unionized people. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and that's true, that's more likely to be true probably in an in a, in a oligopsonized or monopsonized market than in a competitive labor market. Oh, uh, just one thing, you know, I'm not uh, close to the, the, the data on that, the, the way uh, Eric is. Um, and I just wonder also if there's a, a possibility, this may violate the rules of an economic conversation, but if, if culture, you know, if culture and corporate culture has changed uh, uh, in ways that matter since the 1950s. In other words, you know, management, um, I think today is, is um, uh, uh, rewarded for uh, Generally, for maximization of, uh, of shareholder uh, welfare and value, most uh, most uh, straightforwardly, um, and um, it, you know it, another contributing uh, explanation may be that, that there was a sort of different commitment to the sense that uh, having well-paid workers was a representation of, of success, but um, that's just another maybe factor in there. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's very important. You know, a former student of mine named Samuel Milner recently wrote a book about this era after World War II up until about the 70s. And you know, other historians have studied it as well, but there was a kind of a, an agreement um, among uh, the, 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 uh, you know, the, the, the big firms in the oligopsonized industries, steel, uh, autos, and so forth, to, to keep wages going up. And the government actually kind of got involved and would encourage this. And you know, at the same time, they had some oligopoly power as well. So they could you know, raise prices, raise wages. And then you know, there's a controversy over ultimately whether this was a good or a bad thing in the long run. Some people think it led to an inflation, but uh, it was clearly a, a very different era from ours where I do think there's a kind of a cultural or intellectual change which has uh, encouraged um, the management of large firms to just you know, suppress wages the best they can, you know, ideally, you know, ideally, I don't know, through automation or something like that. But, uh, but uh, or I say at least automation is less bad than uh, suppressing people's wages. But, um, but uh, you know, that was less true for the big industries half a century ago. Well, thank you both. This has been just an excellent conversation. Very appreciative. Um, if there, if you, either of you have any final comments or thoughts you wanted to share, uh, please do. Uh, Maybe I'll go first. Um, you know, I just uh, uh, first I really appreciate um, uh, people have taken uh, a listen to this, uh, and I do think we're you know we're in we're we're in a moment here, and uh, it's it's a good time to rethink uh, much of what has been the conventional wisdom for for a long uh, period. I think Eric's making a huge contribution in that respect, and I just want to say the the administration is uh, also you know uh, I think th this administration is committed to, to you know rethinking some of the questions of what it really means to have an economy that works for everybody and um, you know along all kinds of lines so I think these kind of conversations are part of part of that and uh, again thanks for the opportunity to be here yeah, let me say something going back to a, a point uh, Tim made uh, and I think this is something that a lot of people don't understand so uh, this idea that antitrust law should be used in labor markets. Okay, so it's not, as I tried to say before, a radical idea. It's not a left-wing idea or a communist idea or anything like that. It's, it's just a, an idea based on the view, the very conventional view in the United States that, that free markets, competitive markets are good. And what's striking about this in particular is that unlike you know, other types of schemes to try to um, help the, the worst off, like taxing and, and uh, transferring uh, resources. You know, people object to that in part because they don't want to pay higher taxes, but they're, they're worried that it will you know, re reduce incentives to work and, and be a drag on the economy. But the thing is, is that you know, anti-competitive behavior in labor markets and product markets already is a bad, is a drag on the economy and it's bad for lower income people. Okay, so if, if so stronger antitrust enforcement in labor markets and product markets as well, should, should lead not only to higher wages, but lower prices and more output. So the, the pie should get bigger. Everybody should 
you know, become better off at, at, a, at a very general level. But also these workers, you know, their wages will go up. Um, and, and that's from a standpoint of equity and, you know, the kind of the social fabric, which, is, which has been fraying. I think that's, that's very important. So I think this is an exciting um, uh, thing to think about. Uh, I hope that uh, students and academics will put, you know, more energy into, th into thinking about this and that policymakers uh, will, will as well. And, and thank you very much, uh, Mary Alice, for having me on. Yeah, I gotta add that. This is, you know, this is this is a hot, this is a hot area. This is an area where there's just. Uh, I, I remember actually when I was in the Obama administration, my first was like labor antitrust. <laughs> there's so much work to be done in this area, and you know, Eric's doing a lot of people are doing it, but it is a ripe area for, uh, you know, students, academics, policy um, think tanks, whatever, to sort of uh, to, to take uh, some time thinking about. And we are, um, as I said, very. Um, uh, the administration policy councils, you know, are, are interested, are avid consumers of, of the materials that are being generated. So thanks again, Mary. And thanks again to both of you. And thanks to all of you who've joined us today.